there's a lot of noise about what's going on. And I think it's still indicative that IoT hasn't quite arrived yet, especially in the industrial world. Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. This is an episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series brought to you by GE Ventures. In the series, we explore success factors and challenges in industrial IoT markets with CEOs, investors, and experts. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight. I'm joined today by Nicholas Papagorge from CB Insights. Nicholas is a technology industry analyst uh, focusing on IoT, among other fields, at CB Insights. Nicholas, before we dive into our conversation today, give a little bit of background on where, you know, where you're coming from and, and introduce the work that you're doing at CB Insights. I'm a big fan, but some of our listeners might not be familiar. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm really happy to be here first. So thank you for having us on. I come from my first job out of college was at MakerBot Industries in the 3D printing world. But for the last uh, two plus years, I've been at CB Insights. And for those who don't know what that is, CB Insights is a tech market intelligence platform. Uh, And so we use machine learning to crawl hundreds of thousands of uh, sites and basically see what's going on in private markets uh, across the board. So everything from financings uh, to trends broadly going on. If you're a tech investor in the VC space to a corporate innovation group, and you'd use CB Insights as a platform to basically unlock what's going on in the private markets. So what that means is, you know, we track a lot of financings going on into everything from auto tech to industrial IoT. And where I've been focused is on the latter, taking a look at advanced manufacturing, uh, and basically just connected hardware in general in IoT. You're focused on connected hardware are there other analysts that are focused on the software side? How, how did you come to focus on this space? We have analysts focus on everything from uh, fintech, healthcare, uh, logistics, e-commerce, auto tech, and uh, you know pretty much every category you could think of, including some of the horizontal ones like artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, and cybersecurity, things that are kind of more horizontal and touch all verticals. Uh, and we're actually scaling up the research team you know, every, every day we, we do this. But how I came around to doing it is, you know, my background in tech hardware, just uh, seeing the 3D printing world up close, uh, and it seemed like a natural fit. And actually, when I started, you know, consumer IoT, especially in the wearables world, was super hot. Uh, and then since then, I think, as you know, we saw some, uh, you know, some rough news coming out of Jawbone and a lot of these wrist-worn wearables. The focus, as far as investing and investment trends go, has been more into the industrial side. Yeah, that's been my feeling is that wearables, let's say the, the idea is sexy or IoT in, in consumer in general, high level, the idea seems to be very, it presents itself well in social media, right? So connected fridge and so forth. Uh, but then when you start thinking about the actual value proposition and, um, and making that value proposition to a mass market, as opposed to kind of people that are, are willing to buy technology because, you know, for technology's sake, so to speak. I think a lot of these solutions, it's actually quite difficult to, to make a really compelling value proposition. Now, for the industrial space, often it's a lot more straightforward because the businesses, are they've already done, to an extent, the, um, you know, the business mapping. They know what their costs are and uh, what the value of solving a problem is. And then it's around, can these new technologies solve problems? So it makes sense that we'd be transferring. Maybe you can put some numbers behind it because that's, um, you know, that's one of the areas that that CB Insights excels at. So when you say that manufacturing is the biggest and fastest growing area of IoT, how do you measure that? What's the indicator? Yeah, so what we look at first is basically deals going to to young companies in the space. So, you know, broadly in IoT, it's at least eight to nine billion dollars invested in the last five years. So since 2013. And this is across an, at least a thousand deals in the advanced manufacturing space, which encompasses everything from like a new composite, so not necessarily IoT, but uh, also you know connected hardware as well. It, that manufacturing world is uh, around seven billion dollars in investment spend. So a lot of this is still a really a really nascent world. So I think you know just backing up about IoT in general, I think a lot of people know what it feels like. And, you know, they, they know it when they see it, but don't necessarily know what it means. So when I think about it, I think about it as digitization 
of the physical world in a way that wasn't previously possible. So, you know, riding a lot of the trends in the smartphone world, you know, cheaper sensors, cheaper cloud computing, you, know, you were able to start tracking, you know, how many steps you took with your wristband. Uh, the same concept is, is happening in the industrial world. And startups have, have been doing this in several different ways. So some, you know, drafting and the 3D printing wave, some are doing this by actually just retrofitting you know, actual uh, machines with sensors to derive insights from them for the first time. Uh, and there's many different remixes and ways that this is happening. But um, yeah, at the early stage, though, you know, numbers wise, this is still a nascent category. You know, at least 40 to 50 percent of the deals going on in this space are to the early stage. So usually when we see startup categories start to mature, the middle stage uh, is the, the greater chunk of, of deals happening. But still, you know, I think this is in many ways, you know, the lack of the security measures that are, are standards in place. As well as just, there's a lot of different private silos going on. There's tons of different cloud vendors working here. There's a lot of noise about what's going on. And I think it's still indicative that IoT hasn't quite arrived yet, especially in the industrial world. Absolutely. I was talking to Tim Cho, uh, who's a, a professor over at Stanford, and then also on the board of Teradata and, and a few other companies. And his perspective was that we're in you know, really the, the early, let's say, two, three, fourth year of uh, a 20-year cycle in IoT. Um, and so we're very much in the educational. So it makes sense that on the investment side as well, uh, we'd be looking at at seed or or A series. Maybe a, a bit more of a, a tactical question: How do you how do you gather this information? I think getting reliable information around seed early, you know, early investments super challenging just from a practical perspective. How do you how do you gather? How do you uh, how do you validate and, and make sure that the um, you know the analysis that's coming out is uh, is credible? Uh, yeah. So what we do in since inception, we've been using uh, machine learning to to structure a lot of data from hundreds of thousands of these uh, data sources. Some of these are actually just startup financing. Some of these, uh, you know, are in reference to that. Uh, we structure a lot of the data. It sees some human eyes before being logged in our database. And uh, as we've grown uh, into prominence, CB Insights has had some data network effects going on. And by that, I mean. Uh, investors and startups themselves have wanted to edit our database, submit data to us. And, you know, it's really in everybody's interest to have the transparency, especially as more and more investors and uh, corporate venture arms and innovation groups are looking to CV Insights for the right data. So in many ways, it's been a, a little bit of both. In addition to tracking kind of trends around investment, you're also looking at who the investors are. So I think the the other side of the equation in the IoT space, what are you seeing? Is it are we looking more at the um, kind of C stage uh, venture capitals or the early stage venture capitals, or is this a lot of corporate investment going into early stage more maybe as exploratory investments? It's a mix of both, but definitely more corporate participation uh, than in a lot of other categories. So. Uh, most active in industrial IoT broadly, usually GE Ventures tops the list in a lot of these uh, industrial categories. But uh, you know, they're followed behind and not far behind by large and active corporate venture arms like Intel Capital, Cisco, Google Ventures. Basically, a lot of these are industrials or you know large corporates that stand to gain a lot by you know, strategic investment in the area. But also they're joined in by a lot of name brand institutional VCs like Kleiner Perkins, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, Lux Capital, New Enterprise Associates, uh, Clips Ventures. But I would say in the corporate participation world, it's pretty surprising. So maybe just five, six years ago in 2012, you'd see about 17% of the deals in this area involving a corporate uh, venture arm in the deal. But now it's nearly doubled, a little less than doubled, to about 31% just last year involve a corporate. So in general, this is just seeing more corporate interest uh, than just five or six years ago. Interesting. It seems like a lot of corporates have made the uh, strategic choice to, let's say, outsource some of their innovation to startups, right? To say that uh, startups with it, you know, for particular types of innovation are more efficient and it's better than to participate and uh, learn what they're doing, follow them, invest in them, and potentially buy them out when it when it gets to the commercialization phase. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a lot of these industrial conglomerates are really sensing that there's disruption happening, but not, you know, that's like the common startup narrative that everything's getting disrupted. I think a lot of these corporates are also seeing, you know, value in having new partnerships, 
conquering new markets, either by acquiring or working with uh, startups. So it's not necessarily one always eating the other either. If we look at, let's say, the advanced analytics of, so if we were looking at a basketball uh, you know, game, we, we could say you could look at the simple analytics, kind of the score and the, the box and so forth, and then the advanced analytics maybe going a bit uh, a bit deeper and trying to explain why. So if we think a bit uh, you know, harder around what differentiates uh, corporate VC from the traditional VCs, what do you see in behavior in terms of how sticky they are to the investment in terms of, um, you know, buying out startups? Are they, you know, are they basically testing the waters and then, um, and then buying startups out once they reach a, you know, a certain stage of commercialization? What, what kind of insight do you have into kind of the, the deeper behavior of corporate investors here? Could you try to rephrase that question? I'm, I'm still kind of unclear about exactly what you're looking for there. Sure. Well, I guess uh, high level, we could say we, we've we seen a lot more corporate investment in in IoT startups and, and maybe more corporate investment in general in the past uh, couple of years. Are there other factors that differentiate corporates from institutional investors? For example, are corporates more likely to stick with the investment over time or, or maybe less likely? Are corporates... Uh, it, do we see many corporates doing a full acquisition of a startup that they've invested in, in a, uh, let's say, a seed or an A round? And maybe when it gets up to BC, the corporate then you know buys them out after they've properly vetted the technology. I, I don't have a, a good answer for you prepared on that. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I don't have any any particular insight e- either. I'm, uh, I'm imagining there must be some differences between corporates and uh, institutional in terms of you know long-term uh, behavior, but not uh, also not certain high momentum startup. So what are we seeing here in terms of the the value? Are we seeing that it's going toward, you know, in some sectors, uh, in let's say, shared bike, for example, uh, we've seen a couple companies come out in China and eat up a billion dollars in financing quite quickly. Um, are we seeing a similar trend here of having a few high riders that are taking the majority or a significant share of the investment? Or is it kind of spread thinly over a large, uh, a large series of startups? Uh, well, there's definitely a couple names that you know, keep being able to raise large rounds, but the stack, so to speak, in industrial IoT is pretty vast. So I've mapped out the industry before. If people want to check out um, my ideas on this, There's if you just go to cbinsights.com slash research uh, and top startups IoT, uh, there's, or just the industrial IoT market map uh, that we have going, there's several different layers going on that actually have all been pretty attractive investment areas. So, you know, I think of like the top of the stack or, you know, the, the, the bottom, depending on how you think about it, you know, there's sensors and connectivity, you know, the basic things that you need, like the electricity of IoT, you know, there's Sigfox and others that are doing the actual connectivity, basically being telecoms, there's sensors, there's actual satellite connectivity going on. So companies like Fleet and Kepler Communications are actually uh, enabling uh, Constellation satellites to help guide industrial IoT in you know really remote areas. I think above that there's edge devices, there's connected objects, there's robotics, in- inspection drones, 3D printing, things that are uh, very much physical worlds that are starting to get eaten by software a little bit more. I think above that uh, one further there's in universal platforms. Uh, we're seeing companies like C3 or Arrayant, places where uh, in the private world that you park a lot of your industrial data. Above that, you're starting to see more actual applied sensor networks that are specific that uh, and tailored to industry. So maybe like a site machine specifically for manufacturing. And kind of at the, the very bottom, uh, the very end, you know, the most software abstracted away area, you start to see... Uh, a lot more AI and predictive analytics and cybersecurity uh, for uh, the OT, for industrial IoT. And I would say the uh, AI, the, the machine learning, the most you know, software-driven area of this seems to be pretty hot lately, uh, but it's not necessarily the case. Some of the most well-funded, highest momentum companies are probably Desktop Metal and Carbon 3D, which are uh, very much 3D printing companies, so still very much in the edge device world. Uh, and it's hard to say that one is necessarily you know, more attractive than the others, even in connectivity, Sigfox and others are raising like crazy from great name brand VCs. No, interesting. You know, in a conversation last week, the, the, the person I was speaking with pointed out that IoT, you know, you said $7 billion in investment in the past uh, five years or so. 
a lot of a lot of interest, a lot of invest, you know, internal investment, uh, also you know, from corporates and internal uh, initiatives, R and D, and so forth. But when we look at revenue generated, even let's say ThingWorks from PTC, which is you know kind of a market leading cloud platform, they're generating about a hundred million dollars, which is really not that big of a business. You know, maybe GE uh, GE Digital is doing more business, but a lot of that is is maybe um, kind of traditional uh, business that they might have been doing for for ten years now. Are we seeing some of these startups reach the stable revenue point where they're approaching IPO, where where they can actually kind of compete uh, in the in the more formal capital markets uh, based on revenue and profitability, or are we seeing most of these companies still remain venture funded? Um, and uh, and maybe not the indicator yet that we're kind of hitting that hockey stick turn where where companies really start turning this invested capital into revenue and profit. It could be a symptom of just the area. You know, the the acquisition uh, route does seem much higher than uh, you know going public, uh, and that's probably just because there is, you know, for lack of a better term, some synergy to working with uh, or being acquired by an industrials company. I mean, in in 2016. Uh, in IIoT, you saw 32 M&A deals and just one IPO. And you know, a lot of these companies, for example, you know, GE bought Norigo and Bits2 Systems, basically to shore up its Predix platform. And that's what I mean by that. You could probably see more value being acquired than necessarily going public, but that could be indicative that the area still has you know a long way to come. I imagine you know there will be you know a winning private platform of today that could uh, that could possibly be you know, a standalone company tomorrow. It's just hard to see that given where we are today. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, I think commercialization in the industrial space is particularly difficult because of all the components that have to come together. So it makes sense that there would be synergies with uh, with corporates that have, you know, the existing commercial infrastructure. Yeah, well, there's, there's also, you know, there's tons of platforms and the space is incredibly crowded with industrial players. So, you know, GE has Predix, there's PTC Thingworks, there's Microsoft Azure, uh, there's IBM, Watson IoT, Siemens, Cisco, SAP, AWS IoT, uh, and that's just like the public tech giant offerings. You know, there's tons of universal platforms, and I think that's you know that's also part of you know a, a symptom at least of being young is that you just have a lot of siloed proprietary platforms going on and and not a lot of connectivity. Who would be some of the the leading corporates here? I think uh, you'd, you'd mentioned earlier. Um, Caterpillar, Foxconn, who are the companies, you know, let's say beyond the, um, the, the corporate VC space, but the companies that are really driving the technology development here? Like I said before, by long shot, GE Ventures is the, the most active player here. But Google Ventures, Intel Capital, Foxconn, Saudi Aramco, uh, Robert Bosch, Bosch Venture Capital, Verizon Ventures, ABB, Salesforce, Autodesks, their venture arms as far as the corporate world goes, um, you know, are very active, especially in advanced manufacturing. But you know, you're also seeing some you know new activity. I mean, if you compare, for example, Caterpillar's activity from 2012 to today, you know, it's it's night and day. They're starting to get more active. Uh, Honeywell just got active as and kickstarted a venture arm recently. I think there's just a lot more corporate interest uh, in the last couple of years uh, than there's ever been. And where you're seeing a lot of the overlap here, you know, where these Industrials uh, will co-invest. Seems to be around 3D printing. So, um, you know, GE and a couple of these other corporates, you know, went together on uh, desktop metal and carbon. Um, a couple of in- interesting companies also, like Mana, which has been described to me as most like a, a palantir for industry. So, a- any analytics question you'd have, you'd, you know, you'd turn to them. Another one would be Zometry, uh, which I think. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit more about later. It's uh, basically on-demand CNC and 3D printing services, kind of like an Uber for for industry, uh, and that's kind of like a, an interesting first step I've seen in industrial IoT. Yeah, very interesting, and and it's interesting that some of the the companies you mentioned, Caterpillar and Foxconn, both you know what most people would consider to be pretty traditional. Let's say heavy metal companies, so you know Caterpillar on the equipment side and Foxconn manufacturing, but we don't really think of them as as driving innovation for it. And then on the other hand, we have Salesforce and Google, who you know really we think of as more cloud, you know, kind of enterprise cloud computing. Google more on the consumer side, and now we have these two 
uh, very different categories of companies that are competing to an extent for for the industrial innovation space. This is an interesting, I don't know if this is something that you've thought on or have insight, but interesting dynamic where you have and of the Googles and the sales forces who are now in a position where they're trying to develop the industrial or vertical expertise, the, um, the use case expertise to be competitive here, and they have the technical expertise. And then you have these other set of companies who have the, uh, they certainly have the end user insight, they have the industrial expertise, but they need to develop the, uh, the, the competence in IT. How do you see this dynamic playing out? Do you see one of these sides uh, making, let's say, making smarter investments, being more aggressive um, in terms of, the, let's say, the traditional corporates versus the IT as they as they both, you know, compete for the uh, IoT market? Yes and no. I mean, obviously, it probably helps if you're a young startup to be associated with, you know, an, a blue chip name brand uh, industrial conglomerate. Uh, but then again, I think you're seeing a lot of IT and OT trends kind of converging. So, you know, the typical enterprise uh, will have, you know, like a connected lock, for example. uh, And also, you know, the typical industrial enterprise will have a full IT stack in addition to its OT stack. Uh, And so in many ways, you know, the the differences between industry and enterprise are starting to blur. And to be with one over the other is not necessarily... Uh, you know, the route, it depends entirely on, you know, where you're working. Uh, and a lot of these startups are attacking just, you know, one issue, one, you know, kink in the data world of industrial IoT. And, uh, you know, being closer to an IT company might actually make more sense for, you know, a lot of these, especially these software driven ones that are further uh, down or up the stack, depending how you think about it. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess if you're more horizontal, uh, focused on a particular technology domain, maybe it makes sense to to partner with a Google or some uh, Salesforce. And if you're really a- addressing a specific vertical, then Caterpillar or or Foxconn might be the right partner because they can exactly they can they can be a, a huge flagship customer. Yeah, looking uh, looking down into the the future, I think one of the uh, things that CB Insights has done particularly well is is been able to kind of leverage the the data that you're analyzing and, and uh, help companies to understand uh, what might be on the horizon. What are you seeing in terms of the advanced manufacturing roadmap? Where, where do you see us going, let's say, in the next um, three to five years? Three to five years? I mean, I see a lot more uh, going to making advanced manufacturing facilities, so really high OEE facilities, even more efficient. So I think the advanced factories you know, we'll see a lot of this innovation first. But, you know, at some point, there, you know, the, maybe there could be diminishing returns on the productivity to these. But also, you know, I think I see a lot of startups uh, just bringing digitization for the first time to a lot of uh, kind of undigitized areas. So I actually went down into the offices of Odin Technologies, which is a pretty promising industrial IoT company here in NYC. Uh, and really, they, I saw what they were doing. They were hooking up Raspberry Pis to PLCs, the programmable logic controllers, basically the create digitizing for the first time the data streams in uh, plastics manufacturing. Uh, and they were hooking up these, uh, these little small computers to PLCs that might even date to 1960. So there's some of these, some areas uh, and plenty of factories out there today, even in the United States uh, and, uh, and all over, that are just getting digital for the first time in their history. Um, so I think first you'll see a little, a little more innovation happening you know, at, the, at the high end where in factories that are actually you know, used to this stuff will adopt it first. But I think more and more, you know, after five years out from now, um, you'll see more widespread adoption of industrial IoT. Yeah, that's what we've noticed as well, is that a lot of the initial investment is going into the cost side, looking at um, efficiencies. And that makes sense because uh, usually the the business case is a little bit simpler. You can you know if I if I invest in this uh, technology, I can reduce this cost bucket you know and save a particular amount of money. Pretty straightforward. But you can only gain so much there, right? So uh, you can only gain basically up to uh, maximum your cost if you become a zero cost company. So that's the uh, the absolute maximum, and that's uh, not not feasible. So then it really turns to the revenue side. How can IoT help industrials increase revenue? And then that becomes. Uh, in the long term, much more interesting, but also much more challenging, right? Because then you're not just looking at in- improving efficiency, but you're looking at business model innovation. What are you seeing on this side? So um, 
you know, in terms of the shift to, let's say, small batch size, I mean, you were talking around um, uh, interest in 3D printing. That's certainly a, um, a business model innovation that that's going to radically shift how value is created. Uh, do you see, a, you know, um, trends right now in terms of interest in uh, technologies that are focused on reducing cost as opposed to in, uh, technologies that are focused on opening up new revenue opportunities or new markets? I see a mix, but I think reducing cost is, you know, just the low hanging fruit right now. Uh, there's just, just improving a production line uh, by 1% efficiency is just an enormously valuable business problem to solve. Uh, and given that there's really low digitization uh, in a lot of industry, I mean, uh, there, McKinsey ran this great graph uh, that I've included in a couple of my decks before that, you know, the very bottom of, you know, all of industries, you know, the least digitized ones, agriculture, and then construction, moving upwards, you know, you start to see basic goods manufacturing, and even advanced manufacturing, you know, it's far behind finance and insurance, for example, barely ahead of, you know, oil and gas uh, by digitization methods. And that's even, you know, in the best factories. Uh, and the best factories still have, you know, an OEE, an overall uh, operating efficiency here uh, of, of about 85% is world class. That's still 15% you know, efficiency you could still uh, improve upon. You know, and the typical the typical factory is hitting about sixty percent OEE, um, and the low end is about forty. So, it really, you know, cutting costs while it, you know it seems like uh, you know fruitless compared to opening up new business lines, it, it really is you know a, a huge market opportunity still. Uh, and a lot of these advanced manufacturing companies, you know, will will find great niches doing just that. But some interesting, you know, new new remixes uh, that I've been seeing. Two, you know, big trends: just cybersecurity, endpoint security for this industrial IoT world. Also, just a lot of edge computing going on, and some of these, you know, new Uberification things like Zometry, Element, things that will bring, you know, more on-demand or machine-to-machine -machine payments and communications. I think that's also some interesting futuristic stuff. It might be a little further out. But in the short term, yeah, I think the two big big trends I've been seeing is just new cybersecurity layers developed and uh, an edge intelligence and you know, more compute being done at the device level. What about um, supply chain uh, or let's say blockchain for supply chain? So supply chain is another area where there's uh, rampant inefficiency and waste, um, and and for relatively known you know known causes that just have not been able to be uh, solved with existing technologies. Now blockchain. Uh, some companies that uh, I was recently looking at a company called Statwig, which, you know, small company based out of Singapore, which is building a, a solution, uh, kind of a tamper proof end to end tracking solution for um, pharmaceuticals. Obviously, that's a very high value problem because a bad batch of pharmaceuticals or a counterfeit batch could not just cost money, but but uh, really harm people. What are you seeing in this space? Are, are you seeing this as a, a space which is uh, uh, getting significant uh, real investment? Are people really just dabbling in the concept, and is this more of a let's say a five to ten year time frame as the technology matures, or, or do you really see this on the horizon as ter in terms of companies being able to uh, commercialize solutions and uh, and really scale? This is you know extremely cutting edge, uh, more nascent than nascent. You know, as a cryptocurrency enthusiast, I've been seeing uh, whispers of this. You know, uh, the, of deeds and uh, and actual just supply chain management. You know, atop Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, this has been talked about you know since the early days, uh, and I still have yet to see it done uh, really well. Uh, you know, recently there's definitely been an uptick in conversation around this. I think it was you know Tyson or Purdue, you know, some chick chicken manufacturer was really uh, you know trumpeting that this could be you know really big for uh, actual transparency. You could see down to the farm of where uh, the, you know the chicken that you're eating uh, was raised. And I think that's really interesting. I think it, it could bring, you know, down the line, it could mean that there is a near, you know, perfect consumption and production, you know, with proper data, complete transparency. Um, it's a really interesting dream. It could make, you know, really conscious capitalism happen if you're able to look up every uh, which, you know, input that you're consuming, where it came from. But it still is so young. Uh, and there's a lot of different projects like, Hyperledger, they're working to attack this. I think what's interesting is that, you know, the first question you should really ask about blockchain in the space is, does it even need a blockchain? 
Um, you know, a lot of these companies already trust each other and do business together. And that's kind of like the, the essential question is, do these, you need to actually trustless computing to make a blockchain make sense. So if it can be done with a database you know, today, it just be a more efficient database. It might not necessarily require blockchain. When I'm considering blockchain and, you know, kind of looking at how the use cases are structured, the other challenge I see, and, you know, I'm no expert here, but uh, blockchain, as long as it's fully digital, right, it's uh, the, the transactions are all on a computer, fairly, fairly clear how the uh, data flows. But when you actually get down to, say, tracking a chicken, to some extent, you need a device um, implanted on every chicken and then a reader to, you know, read that the, the data off of that device at, you know, multiple points through the, um, the supply chain. I was, I was maybe in an extreme case. I was talking with a, a guy who's running a, a business down in India, does um, MES for, uh, for, you know, steel factories, and they're building a, a solution for scrap yards, right? And steel scrap, just the messiest supply chain you can imagine, right? A dump truck dumps a piece of, you know, a big pile of scrap somewhere. And then next door, they dump another pile of scrap and next door another. And so you've gotten a hundred different piles of scrap, you know, different mixes, different qualities. They're all sitting next, they're mixing together. And somehow you have to pick these up and, you know, repeatedly move them around, eventually put them into production. And you have to say, this is this, you know, this scrap has this quality and it's, it's producing this grade of steel. But then how do you, on the digital side, no problem, but in the physical world, how do you actually track the movement of that, you know, good with amount of reliability? I, I see this as a problem with supply, uh, with uh, with blockchain. Just the 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 human uh, or the physical challenge of of actually tracking and uh, and scanning this. I, I know you're not a you know an expert. You're more of a, a you know I guess a, interested in the space. So I shouldn't put you on the spot. I think this, but I, I don't know if you have any insight into let's say applying blockchain to the physical world and and the the human challenges of actually tracking physical goods. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, in supply chain management there's not necessarily one source of truth. So if you have like a trustless network going on, you, you actually, or let me, let me step back and rephrase here. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to do and apply a blockchain to supply chain management, first need to make sure that there is no one source of truth. I think what, what happens in supply chain management, there isn't, you know, one source of truth. There's employees that can mishandle a shipment you know, it could be knocked over and unreported, you know, a bad quality delivery could go a week before discovery. And, you know, you really would need some verification uh, of a physical uh, and digital ledger. So really what that would require to me is, you know, that's the, the essentially the, the promise of IoT, you know, software eating the atom world or, you know, allowing you to reliably uh, verify what's going on in the atom world. The thing is, though, you know, will, will everybody in a supply chain be that diligent about updating the blockchain if something goes wrong? It, it's hard to say. And that's why it, it, it might not even be for the next few decades, a blockchain problem. It might just be a database problem. You know, you can have all the perfect RFID tagging systems in the world. Uh, and it might make, you know, everything more efficient, but it still might not even require a blockchain to, uh, to uh, extract, you know, that, that improved efficiency. So I'm curious to see, you know, how it happens going forward. And I think in theory, it unlocks some really amazing things, especially when you bring in, uh, you know, the machine to machine payments, or when autonomous vehicles are the ones shipping between the suppliers, uh, and you have a very much an autonomous uh, supply chain going on. I think that's where you'll, you know, you'll really see, you know, riding the autonomous vehicle wave, it could seem to be in that timeline, but still, that it even requires a blockchain has yet to be proven. And there's some really high profile projects, like I mentioned, Hyperledger, that are really trumpeting this. Uh, I, I'm still kind of uh, a little bit skeptical and just remaining to, or waiting to see some, uh, some solid use cases for this. No, that's a great point. I mean, until yeah, sensors are ubiquitous and, uh, and automated, probably uh, that's the first, uh, the first barrier. And then, yeah, do we really need a blockchain or is there already trust and it's just a matter of uh, data accuracy? Last uh, last question. If you could kind of shine the spotlight on one, you know, one company that you've been following and are super interested, but might be kind of under the radar for for most investors or or just uh, kind of the general industrial audience, uh, who would that be? If you can uh, maybe just share a little bit about what they're doing. One interesting wave that I mentioned before, going on with the uh, the edge computing trend, um, you're starting to see also more increased. 
uh, cybersecurity measures being taken. So, you know, one of the big drawbacks of IoT has been that it's it's extremely vulnerable to cybersecurity hacks. I think if anybody uh, who paid attention to the Mirai botnet uh, could tell you that th- there's tremendous uh, possibilities for IoT be- to be used for the wrong. And, you know, when you're starting to connect critical infrastructure, uh, especially uh, in SCADA systems and, you know, highly sensitive areas like utilities, you know, things that uh, would be the first targets for, you know, a, a hack or an, especially a nation-sponsored one. Uh, securing, you know, critical infrastructure is really important. I think a really interesting company that can illustrate, you know, a blend of on-premise and, you know, digital uh, security is this company called NIMI. And to illustrate what NIMI does, uh, you know, they've kind of, they've been operating in wearables for quite some time. But what they do is they, they use a wristband to read uh, electrocardiogram signals on your wrist. So the example would be, you know, let's say you're Homer Simpson and you're, you know, you're operating your, your nuclear facility. If you step into the bathroom and uh, some, you know, James Bond style villain were to come in uh, and attack you, they wouldn't be able to get into the system, you know, in your absence, for example. They would need to have your electrocardiogram on premise uh, in front of the computer to verify that you're you and also able to be in the computer. Uh, and so that it's kind of a blend of, you know, the, the on-premise idea that the, you are you in atoms and then also uh, that you are where you're supposed to be. I, I think that's kind of an interesting blend. I also think critical infrastructure is one of those things that, you know, just deserves to have a lot of uh, security. And uh, I think you'll see, you'll see more interesting blends uh, that, will, that will bring biometric security as well as actual digital security. No, super interesting um, use case there. So they they require basically biometric proof that the individual that has access to this is sitting in in the in the vicinity, yeah. basically. So talk to me about edge computing. Um, this is a space. I think we, what I've been understanding is that there was a, initially a rush to the cloud because cloud is something that uh, enterprises are comfortable with. A lot of traditional software uh, migrated to the cloud. In industrial, it doesn't make as much sense because getting the data out of a proprietary environment, a factory, uh, for example, up to the cloud, you have uh, latency issues, you have security issues. So edge computing, uh, for some use cases, makes a lot more sense. Uh, We've recently seen more interest there. From your perspective as an analyst, what do you see in in terms of the maturity and uh, interest level in edge computing? Well, I think it's just where the future is going broadly for IoT in general. So right now we live in a very centralized world. So when you run a Google search, you're hitting you know the central Google data center and being routed back with the with your answer. The same thing happens when you're doing uh, a lot of these uh, industrial IoT networks. You're sending it to a centralized source, uh, but a lot of industry can't afford that latency, like you mentioned. Uh, and you're starting to see more compute being done at the device level. And a lot of this is riding some machine learning trends going on. So you're starting to have uh, more capabilities, you know, especially as NVIDIA and others are making uh, machine learning ever more powerful. More machine learning algorithms and apps will be able to kind of catalyze this trend of more computation being done at the device level. In industrial networks too, you don't necessarily need to be sending you know, 90 million messages that everything's going fine, everything's normal. You know, really, it's the anomalies that are worth sending to a centralized cloud. Uh, And you're starting to see a lot of interesting companies like Foghorn, VMock, Clearblade that are, you know, really adding, you know, app layer uh, and algorithms to help facilitate that. Um, And there's also kind of a subset of security that's also going on. So as you have more device level computation going on, you also need in like an identification. You know, I kind of call this the identification of things. So you have Mokana, for example, that does this on both IT endpoints and, and OT endpoints, you know, broad industry uh, kind of coverage. And then there's also another one, Rubicon, uh, that's, all, that's doing a similar thing, but specifically in industrial IoT networks. Gotcha. These last uh, security companies, are these uh, companies that have uh, kind of been doing more traditional um, IT security previously and now are, are developing solutions for Edge? Or are they startups that are 100% focused, uh, built around securing the edge? I don't know the answer to that right now. I think 
So I, th I think Mokana has, and actually, you know, actually, I'm not going to speak to either of that. I don't know exactly their history, but I do know that they're, uh, they're focused uh, increasingly, especially Rubicon has been you know, touting the, uh, the industrial side of it more recently. I've noticed a couple companies that are recent startups focused exclusively on edge. A wider, a wider group of companies are kind of coming from the cloud side, but they do seem to be migrating their focus towards uh, edge computing, whether it's on the analytics side or the uh, security side. So yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, trend to be monitoring. Well, it, it is interesting. Uh, and you know, I think Peter Levine from, uh, from A16Z is an excellent video on just this broad trend. But uh, you know, riding these these waves of uh, edge computing happening, you know, more machine learning, more computation being done at the device level. You know, what what happens in the future is an, an industrial drone essentially is you know a data center with wings. Uh, a single robot could be armed with the same you know capabilities and machine learning that you know a an autonomous vehicle uh, you know at Google is today. So, you know, the future going forward is that there's just incredible smarts uh, without being, you know, without the latency of a central server. Uh, and this will definitely change you know, what IoT means going forward. It's kind of synonymous to the, you know, the supercomputer of the 80s now fitting in your, your iPhone, right? So um, as we, you know, as we continue to improve power of compute and, uh, and size, then uh, we'll, we'll be moving towards a world where a lot of work can be done in, a, you know, small devices. I'm also still uh, looking for, you know, more uberfication, more on-demand companies that I think are really interesting. I think lately I've started to see more financings uh, going on to robotics as a service. Some on-demand ones, I mentioned Zometry before, which is really kind of like a, something, a semblance of an uber for industrial production. So the idea being that there's a, a decentralized, you know, you want an order done, there's a decentralized network of CNCs and uh, machiners to help fill your order and do your parts. Um, and I think this is also uh, really interesting just with the trend of just-in-time manufacturing. I recently read that yeah, the, the Honda facility in the UK only holds an hour's worth of parts at, at any given time. So, you know, the, the Brexit is actually affecting them direly because you know, they're not able to, to have the parts they need clear the border in time. You know, to only be able to hold one hour's worth of parts uh, at a given time, sounds like a great you know, use case for commercial 3D printing. And I think you'll see more of these you know, continue. I think uh, here in New York, there's an interesting one called Voodoo Manufacturing, employing the same idea. Some ex-MakerBot employees form this company that is you know, a production facility employing robotics to actually you know, take the, uh, a, a finished print off of uh, the tray of a MakerBot 3D printer. Um, and I think you'll see more at-scale printing uh, CNCing and more decentralized manufacturing as well, um, but you know who's going to be the Uber of this situation? Still, you know, extremely early innings for something like that. Uh, interesting. One of the the topics that uh, comes up a lot in you know in China or let's say in in Asia is um, we you know if you look at China, India, a lot of the infrastructure is not you know it's not built up. So there's actually a stronger value proposition for. Uh, Uber business models, because if you don't have the uh, mature supply chains and if you don't have the assets properly distributed and the, uh, you know, the distributors in place to make sure um, people are able to access assets, there's a need for, you know, kind of new low capex uh, models. So in India, Mahindra Mahindra, they've launched, um, you know, an internal spinoff or internal startup called Tringo, which is basically a um, kind of a Uber for agriculture equipment. So if you need to rent a tractor for two hours, right? And if you're a small Indian farmer, right, you're you've got a you know you've got a hectare, a couple hectares of land. You certainly can't afford your own tractor, but you certainly need one, you know, during harvest for a few hours, maybe a few hours a week to bring the crop in. So really strong business model, and there's just no existing infrastructure to meet that need. Are you following primarily the U.S. or uh, U.S. and European markets? Uh, to what extent are you also kind of surveying, let's say, the the developing nations? I, I would say most of of industrial IoT financings uh, and startup activity is in the United States, and and so for that reason, it's been mostly limited to that. Uh, but we track things all over, and I think some interesting uh, agriculture trends that you were talking about uh, is DJI starting to offer. Uh, an agricultural 
an industrial sized drone. So for crop dusting and other things, I, I think the remixes on IoT, you know, not necessarily limited to you know, to innovation in the United States by any means, especially you know as drones and other uh, you know the physical work aspects of uh, of industry is is able to be done on some of these newer technologies, be it three D printing or uh, or drones. I think you'll see more interesting things coming out of the developing world. Actually, yeah, I think uh, now um, what is it? 80, 90% of drones are manufactured out of, uh, out of China. That doesn't mean all the value is coming out. A lot of the software might be produced otherwise, but uh, uh, certainly a strength here. So last, uh, last question, how can people get in touch with you? How can they learn more about your work at CB Insights? Sure. So uh, I, first, I highly recommend people who are interested in CB Insights check out our newsletter. I'd say you know, we're known far and wide for having a really fun and data-driven newsletter. Just cbinsights.com slash newsletter. Um, and you'll see a lot of our data visualizations, our research. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter at N-P-A-P-P-A-G. So Nick Papa George. Uh, anybody can uh, look me up, send me a message uh, on there. Happy to respond. You know, I'm really interested in uh, connected hardware broadly. And uh, if you have any insights or questions, um, please reach out. Nicholas, thanks so much for taking the time to walk through uh, your uh, experience as an analyst in the space with us. Look, I, I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series. You can learn how GE Ventures goes beyond funding to support their partners in technology development and commercialization at www.geventures.com.